I will start off by thanking everybody for being here. Um, again, I'm Shane Meyer. I am with the Ohio uh, Nature Conservancy, the Nature Conservancy, TNC. Uh, you can find us on the Ohio TNC Agriculture YouTube page for all of our recordings uh, from the past three sessions that we've done here. This is the fourth and final session to the deep dive into cover crops that uh, Dave and Jay Brandt have graciously given us their time to put this on uh, with myself and the Nature Conservancy. Uh, so thank you very much, guys. Uh, I'm glad that you've all been here through this whole uh, this whole webinar series that we've had. Uh, it's been very educational for myself, so I hope that it's been very educational for you guys also. So tonight we're gonna go over, uh, as you can see here, uh, the planting and termination uh, procedures for these cover crops. Uh, all of the brassicas, the grasses, the, um, I'm sorry, I'm losing my, my words right now. Um, so all broad leaves. Yes, thank you, broad leaves. Um, and uh, so I will now turn it over to um, Jay and Dave so that we can get this going and don't keep you all too long. Well, it's great to be here this evening. Thank you for all attending and hope we can uh, talk to you about some ideas and things that we do on our farm for uh, uh, getting uh, the cover crops established and then also uh, terminating them and uh, uh, lower our herbicide and uh, nutrient cost. Yep, so again here we put up the agenda, which is uh, in a broad sense, the ideas of what we want to cover during our discussion here. And we want it again to be a discussion. So feel free to raise your hand or chime in with some questions and we'll try to address them as best we can going through. But again, uh, in general, you know, we're gonna promote the use of a three crop rotation as much as possible. So we're gonna start out and talk about where the greatest utility in, in soil improvement and building soil health is, is planting after small grain, and then working up through some other concepts throughout there. So, and we may spread in a little bit, uh, the last two topics in regards to strip till and perennial cover crops throughout the rest of it. Uh, not just gonna limit that to the end of the discussion. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah. The, the real important thing is, is uh, Make sure you're ready to plant cover crops. Try to get the residue as far spread as evenly and as wide as you can. Uh, it was interesting today that uh, we had a fella come and get some seed from us and is from McDon, and he was going to Wilmington, Ohio to set up a new 60 foot draper header for a combine to be used this summer. The question I ask him, how are you gonna spread that residue evenly 60 foot wide. And he said, well, they don't worry about that. And I says, well, if you're trying to do cover crops and keep insects down, we've got to get that residue out as wide as you're cutting. So, uh, you know, that's the big thing. So uh, be aware of making sure you get your residue spread evenly uh, as you harvest uh, corn, wheat, and small grains. Yep, and small grains, especially, I think because of the heavy residue from that standpoint, if for us, when we're harvesting rye and triticale, right, because they have a lot more, they're taller, so you've got a lot more straw coming out. It's really important for us to get that very evenly distributed so that we don't run into any issues with the cover crop emergence after the small grain harvest. Well, if it's not evenly spread in the spring, like coming up, that we've had rain clear up till two days ago, uh, those places where the residue is, uh, two thirds thicker than anywhere else, it is like a mud ball underneath there. So that's why it's so important to spread that residue and get that out there the best you can. Uh, hey, hey guys, Jay, Jay and Dave, your slides aren't advancing. Oh, the slides aren't advancing. Nope, we just see the, still it's the cover slide. Mm -hmm. And then we see the slides on the left-hand side. Sorry. That's okay. We'll get it figured out here. Okay. So there's the agenda, agenda slide. All right. Now let's see if we can. 
Technology is wonderful. Dancing. There you go. All right. All right. There's the combine. <laughs> so that's what we're talking about is trying to spread this residue evenly. You can see uh, we have a 30 foot draper on this uh, rotary combine and uh, we can actually blow that wheat straw that far uh, through the back of the combine and through the spreader. So again, our most common method for seeding after small grains to ensure a really good crop establishment is with a grain drill. Uh, so, and again, here, this was uh, what we used primarily for several years on that, the Krauss drill, which is a double disc drill and it worked very well in our uh, farm. Yes, and the reason the lids are open and there's a rider there, uh, we do an awful lot of work in one field every year with doing uh, what I'm gonna call test plots or trying to see what does uh, mix A with five species do better than mix B with eight or, or what happens and what species come. So we do a lot of this and we do it uh, full length field. Uh, so we have somebody usually rise to help keep all the meters full because we're not filling a drill clear full to make those kind of test plots, you know. Uh, but we find the drill works extremely well in the wheat residue and have done a nice job for us. So commonly we will use a mix of seeds like dad's talking about here. So this would be a high carbon species that we would use. And we're again, setting the calibration for this is real important each time. Uh, we do get some slight variation year to year, even in our own drill, just from the use yes. of itself and some variation in the seed density. Uh, each year. So that's real uh, important for you to know how to calibrate your drill and to make sure that you're getting a good even seating across the width. And yeah, this drill is pretty nice. Uh, uh, this is a 13 foot drill. Today we have a, a 30 foot drill, uh, same kind. It's a Krauss uh, and it'll hold as much as 90 acres worth of cover crop. Uh, we don't put that much in the drill anymore. Uh, we found that about 45 acres of this kind of species mix. At about 45 acres, the sunflowers start moving to the top. So we get some segregation. So we, we try to only plant about 35 acres and refill it and go on rather than have uh, sunflowers all in the last 20 or 40 foot of the field, you know. Yeah, so we don't see a lot of segregation no, but to that effect. Uh, we try to minimize it from that standpoint because we know we get a little bit of stratification just because of the weight and that we get that bouncing in the field and the up and down on the turn rows causes that a little bit. So and, you know, this, that... this kind of high carbon blend species gives us the opportunity then to have these plants grow an extra 45 to 60 days versus a corn bean rotation. So that means most of these plants will be uh, uh, close to maturity uh, and have really deep roots. So we're looking at, uh, if you look at this package of cover crops in this blend here, uh, you will have roots from four inches deep to as deep as five or six foot. And in between there also. Yep. So is there any specific seeds that you guys only do small acres with like the sunflowers or uh is that just a uh a rule of thumb that you use across the board for all of your seeds so that they don't separate oh, we, we try to use we try to use all the you know we try to use eight to ten different maybe 12 different species uh depending on what fields what we need to do to bring up nutrients is from deep below the plow pan uh the reason we like the sunflowers is that puts a lot of aesthetics when people drive by, the fields really look nice. Uh, landlords are really pleased to have that done. And uh, it keeps our conventional neighbors from talking to our landlords saying we're growing weeds <laughs> in so, the summertime. Right, and to Shane's question, uh, sunflowers and say oats are very light seeds. And they're generally the ones that are going to float or, or stratify in the seed mix. Uh, if we're late in the season and just planting a mix of rye and clover and vetch, 
We generally don't worry about stratification much with there because they pack very well and we don't, the, the density is very similar from that standpoint. So it's usually, again, as, as Shane mentioned, in a mix with oats or a mix with sunflowers that we start to see uh, stratification and we worry about how much is in the drill box. And again, if you're, if you're small and you only got a 10 foot drill, you know, going back there and stirring it up with your hand, because you, you know, you need to get up and walk around every once in a while anyway. <laughs> so uh, that can be how you can address that issue as well. But a 10 foot uh, drill isn't going to hold a lot of seed anyway. Right. right. So there's many other ways. And uh, maybe before we get to this, you know, we mentioned the Krauss drill is a double disc drill. There's nothing wrong from our opinion with a double disc drill. A lot of guys like the deer style single disc drill because you get less disturbance, you know, less soil movement. And, and for true no-tillers, that's definitely a consideration. Where you've got more fragile soils, that's a more important consideration from that. Uh, from our standpoint, we like the double disc drill because it does uh, fluff the soil a little bit more. And we uh, have appreciated it in the spring, especially when we're doing our actual crop planting, uh, where we're worried more about smearing the sidewalls with the disc and things of that nature. That's where the double disc drill is more important for us on our soils, although we see less concern with that as we increase soil health and have better tilth. And, you know, and then of course this picture is to show you know, a manure wagon, and this happens to be from Michigan State. Uh, they've done an awful lot of work in Michigan with uh, how to incorporate manures, how to do it right. So uh, this is probably, I think this was a 3,000 gallon tank with an airway tool hooked onto the back of it uh, with the distributors to the manure behind the airway. Uh, the airway tool is a thing that has a, uh, like a four or five inch uh, sharp angle, about six inches deep or six inches long. It actually just goes and post holes in the ground. Uh, at the same time, uh, I think they were putting in like four bags of rye because that's how far they could go with 3,000 gallon manure. Uh, as long as you have good agitation in the tank uh, as you're going, the rye will not settle out. And they've been really successful uh, putting manure and rye, getting your cover crops established when you're applying the manure. So you'd actually get two jobs done at once here. Yep. Some, some good things to think about. Yeah, but radish is another popular seed that yes. jumps into liquid slurry like that. Uh, it seems to tolerate it. Again, you're not going to let it sit too long, just like putting cover crop seed with your fertilizer blend. Uh, you don't want it to sit together very long. The fertilizer, whether it's liquid or dry, uh, that salt will tend to kill the germ really quick. So you have to be careful with that. But this is a good application. Like Dad said, it's the way to get two things done at once. Uh, and, and minimize the trips across the field, of course. And, and they found reddishes work a lot better because most generally you put two or one or two or three pounds of reddish in a, to an acre and they're getting not quite uh, an acre in a tank. They put about 3,000 gallon on an acre. So, you know, you only got a pound, three pounds of reddishes in that big tank. So you don't have to worry about settling out, you know. Yeah. So we have to think about uh, what we want to do with the cover crops, you know, uh, as far as strategy from that. Do we want winter kill types uh, or do we want to plant higher rates for forage if we're bringing cattle or other grazing animals on or something that we would take off, say, as a wet wrap or baleage? Or do we want winter hardy plants? And so we think about what our strategy is on that. And that's going to, you know, consider, make considerations on what species we select. And we've talked about that quite a bit in the previous selections. The, the, thing, the nice thing about knowing the strategy of your management is, you know, if you're picking winter kill crops, you want to make sure you, you pick varieties that, that tend to uh, uh, decompose rather rapidly. Because if you get uh, a lot of dead residue cover in the spring, it's harder for the sunlight to get on the ground and especially for the wind to dry the surface out. So those are some things I think, uh, the nice thing about a winter kill cover, it's probably brown you don't need to use a burn down on it, but uh, sometimes it's a lot better to have something green and growing than uh, a, a mat of uh, uh, brown residue there that's not gonna help dry out the soil. Do you have any examples on the top of your mind that would uh, leave a lot of uh, ground cover 
Um, you know, think a lot of people are using oats and radishes, I think, and I like oats and I like radishes, uh, but you have to look at when you plant them and how thick you're going to plant them. You know, some guys will put uh, 40 or 50 pound oats on and then they'll, they'll actually winter kill in about January. Uh, they'll fall down uh, and they actually fall tight down against the soil where a lot of cover crops will, will leave uh, a two or three inch gap between the soil and where the plant's laying because of the, the stem quality of the plant. But an oat will just lay flat and then that is really tough to get dried out in the spring. So, you know, if you lower the seed grade of the oats and have a little soil showing in between her, that seems to help in that situation. But you also increase the erosion factor because you've loosened that soil with that oat root uh, and that's what we want to do with it. And uh, so the chances of more erosion could be a problem if it's a dead cover. So the other side of it would be, say, a warm season grass, like uh, sorghum sedan grass or lots of millet. From that standpoint, uh, higher rates of those as well. So if you want to build a lot of carbon, there are great ways yeah. to add carbon to your soil. Uh, but again, if you're at forage rates and you don't remove that, you're left with a lot of biomass. Now, you do get a lot of decomposition over the winter. But there is, uh, again, you will have a lot of sticks out there in the field to consider. Uh, and again, we talk a little bit more about uh, planter setup and things. So there are obviously tools that you can apply to your planter, you know, row residue managers and things of that nature that can help out. And in those situations, that's how you want to plan for that as part of your management strategy. One of the things we hadn't talked about yet with the grain drill was uh, depth of placement for the seed, right? So for larger seeds mixes that we have, we can go a half inch or greater. Uh, but if we've got really small seeds like clovers and rapeseed in there, we wanna try to keep it in that half inch range a quarter. or a quarter inch, you know, depending on uh, how tightly you can adjust your drill. Again, for us with a double disc opener, uh, it's a little looser again, because we've got more soil disturbed at the surface, but with the single disc, uh, with the shoe and uh, the packing wheel, you know, you can run them fairly tight and very consistent in, in that seed depth range. So just uh, keep that in mind. You don't want to bury the clovers too deep and make them struggle and suspect to winter kill. Uh, and you don't want to, obviously, I think because you're planting in the, the warmth of the year, uh, we don't necessarily have to worry about getting seeds too deep from right. that as well as long as we're not you know in a droughty type condition as well because that can also run into other issues and factors right. you have to consider so here we have some ideas uh this i think this was an organic guy a farmer uh so he's running his cover crop on his last pass of cultivation uh and he's just tickling the soil behind there those are just uh danish tines that only goes about an inch and a half or two inches deep and uh, he spreads as he goes. Uh, that spreader will throw about 20 foot and he's using an eight roll cultivator to wipe out the weeds this area. And then the, the cover crop will come and suppress the weeds and also help build a little nitrogen to feed uh, the corn plant to improve yield and test weight. Yep, so very common practice. We see a lot of organic farmers using in uh, their last tillage pass, but also uh, down south, very popular uh, to spread in uh, standing crops as well with uh, either a front or rear mounted spinner spreader. This is Penn State's uh, interseeder that they've designed. It does a really nice job. Uh, they have two rows in between each uh, or, or three or three depending on the row width on 30 inch rows you'll have two on 36 to 40 inch rows you can have three to four uh, and they actually this will actually plant the cover crop seed um, right in beside the corn and uh, give you a cover there from midsummer till fall and this size here we're looking at probably is, which is close to v3 in the corn is what we understand to be probably one of the best times to do it. The earlier uh, you get going, especially here in Ohio, because corn grows really fast and can outcompete then your cover crop if you're doing this interseeding. So we want to get the, the 
cover crop established well. And we know from uh, university studies that once the corn is here at B3 and later, that we're not worried about interference or competition effects uh, that we see, which are very common earlier with corn uh, that can limit uh, yield potential and things of that nature. So generally past V3 uh, with corn is the sweet spot uh, to get it done. Right. Another thing you have to be aware of is make sure that as if you're using uh, burn downs or residual herbicides ahead of the corn, that you understand how long the life of that herbicide is going to last. Uh, if it's a herbicide that tends to have a 90 to 110 day window uh, to prevent growth from uh, small seedlings, uh, guess what? That's what you're planting, small seedlings, and it will probably take it out, you know. So you get to more advanced operations with uh, the air seeder. Uh, and so this is uh, folks over in Pennsylvania again doing this work. But you can see that you can go from fairly simple units to much more complex from that, there's a lot of options these days, several manufacturers making these uh, interseeders. Uh, so they generally have uh, seen some fairly good uh, reports on reliability and durability as well as access to parts, which right. is pretty good. And, this is, and I know this farmer, this is Jim Hershey's farm in Pennsylvania. Uh, they use a Valmar seeder. Uh, they also mix urea with the cover crop. Uh, and I think at this, uh, in this field, he was putting on about 30 to 50 pounds of urea with about 15 to 20 pounds of cover crop. And the corn was more than likely about two and a half, two foot to two and a half foot tall. You know, so a little taller corn than you saw with the drill. Yep. And again, for interseeding in corn, we know that you're limited because again, the shading effects of corn as we get the canopy closure can limit us you know, away from small grains like oats and rye are just not as successful in that competitive environment. So you switch to things like annual ryegrass or traditional perennial grasses, along with brassicas like rape and radish, and then some small seeded legumes, vetch, crimson, and regular medium red clover they could be very successful. And again, the rates on those are much lower as well. So you see here, the small 30 bushel seed box, you know, at 10 pounds or up to maybe up to 20 pounds per acre, you can still do a significant amount of acres without having to reload over and over again. And to, to Dad's point, you could do blends with fertilizer uh, without having to worry about seed burn. Right. So here we get into some more complex structures. This is Mike Shooter's farm, and he's taking those similar Dawn duo seed row units, but he has them mounted on his Miller bar. So he's replacing the nitrogen injectors with these row units, uh, and really being able to side dress some liquid 28. And you can see the small air seeder in there uh, to broadcast seed as well. So you get both benefits here, again, doing uh, applying your side dress and putting cover crop down at the same time. And in a means where you can, it's very visual from that standpoint to see what's going on and be able to control things. This is a picture of Lauren Steinlegge. Uh, in this case, you could be uh, interceding your summer soybean crop, or in his case, and many folks that are doing now, is this relay cropping concept where uh, he's going to harvest the rye as grain and leave the soybeans in the field and then come harvest the soybeans later. So there are particular challenges with equipment for this in regards to harvesting as well to not damage the soybeans too much. But again, in a corn soy rotation, this gives you the ability, especially in the northern areas where Lauren is, you know, northern Iowa, with the limitation in crop rotation, uh, to really get a three crop rotation in and expand his ability, you know, to improve soil health that way. Yeah, that's correct. And, you know, it's a, it's a challenge to do two things at once, uh, but uh, Lauren seems to have the handle on how to get that accomplished. Uh, uh, I think one nice thing when you think about where they're at there, you know, he's, uh, he's northern Iowa. Uh, the soils are a little cooler maybe, but they have longer growing degree days. They have a little more sunlight than we do, seems like. And uh, he's quite successful with uh, going in and getting uh, 25 or 30 bushel of rye and then coming back and cutting 45 to 50 bushel beans, uh, which uh, you know gives him two case crops off of a single acre. 
you know. So one thing, if you weren't going to harvest for grain and you wanted to terminate without crushing the soybeans, uh, you know, there are manufacturers that make individual row units for row crimping. So then uh, even with corn, not necessarily only with soybeans, you could use a modified toolbar uh, to go in and do that post uh, emergence. So this is where Shane, if you have an idea for your strip till bar, right, uh, to leave the cover crop uh, in there and get the corn established, and then you can come back and terminate uh, before the corn uh, starts to struggle for sunlight in that standpoint. So, or even manage uh, a perennial crop if you can uh, use the roll crimper to uh, inhibit growth, right, and stun it and allow the corn to get in front. So it's another option, another tool in the tool shed, again, to help go towards this idea of reducing the use of herbicides, using more natural systems from that standpoint. The other thing that was really popular and, and a lot of guys are still looking at is this Romo concept, again, to manage that uh, residue in between your rows, whether it be corn or soybeans, right? So you can get uh, in an area where maybe you've done strip till with a toolbar or you're doing a biological strip till where say you planted your cover crops last fall using radish as where you're gonna have that winter kill and then you have overwintering species between. So here, either with the roll crimper <clears throat> or with uh, something like this, a Romo, that you can manage uh, the, the, what's growing in there, your cover crop. So it gives you some options and flexibility uh, from that. Now, obviously there's equipment challenges and things of that nature. I can't even imagine the amount of, uh, that you, you know, the horsepower you need to pump all that hydraulic fluid and <laughs> get it cool and everything like that. But again, uh, on small uh, concepts and things, uh, these are definitely interesting and unique ideas on ways to do management and prove out concepts. Correct. So here's a biotill. Uh, what we talk about biotill and what, what was in here was reddishes and probably uh, maybe just a little bit of oats sprung in the middle of it. So the reddish and the oaks died during the winter. And so he was able to go back in here and plant his corn right on that biotill row and left the cover crops uh, keep growing. And then they'll, they'll either come in and terminate that with a, uh, uh, a spray or just come in with the little uh, 28 inch roller Jay had in the picture and roll down the residue in the center, you know. Right, and the other concept could be that if he planted the corn and in this case, maybe cereal rye at the same time, right? So you can get some weed suppression by that early growth of the rye and then the corn would canopy over it and suppress the rye. Uh, so there's a lot of options that you could look at in lieu of that. But the, the concept here is to illustrate what bio strip till would look like. Uh, and, then talk, and then you can decide what type of management, whether it be chemical management or herbicide management later on. So again, if you've got a uh, twin row cedar, it's another way to look at that, to do <clears throat> managed uh, strip type uh, man management from that standpoint. And this is a very popular way. Uh, a lot of folks are worried about the rye causing issues with your row units and your ability to seed really well and uniformly. So if you can manage this either by shutting off your rows on your drill or having a, a, a twin row type setup, it's just another option for establishing that cover crop and allowing you, you know, an ease of management. So it all depends on, on where you're at and, and how you want to do that management. And the nice thing about a twin row machine like this, it gives you the opportunity to have uh, cereals in one box on one side of the row and probably uh, brassicas and clovers on the other side, you know, uh, uh, and, doing a really nice job of precisionally planting all of them, which actually lowers your seed costs tremendously uh, because you're actually placing those seeds where you want it. And, uh, you know, this in this case, I think uh, they're using wheat in the twin rows, then they moved over and they're planting twin row beans right beside them in this case here. Right, and, and most manufacturers now have small grain plates for their vacuum meters. 
Yes. Uh, so it's easy to put either small grain or mixtures in those because you can use uh, soybean cells for seed mixtures sure. right. uh, with backer plates. So it's becoming very commonplace uh, and a <clears throat> very common practice for guys that are, are in this mode of using cover crops and management. Uh, I will mention that uh, most, a lot of these pictures that I have borrowed from Dan Perkins presentation when he was at our farm a couple years ago. So many thanks to him and the work that he was doing over in Indiana right. uh, to kind of promote these activities as well. Interseeding uh, does have some RMA restrictions. Right, right. And you know, these are things you need to be aware of. Uh, you need to make sure that uh, your RMA agent is willing to work with you on that. Uh, you know, because sometimes there is failures, you know, it just, that's how we've learned as much as we've learned is have the failures that we've had, you know. Yep. And again, uh, because the, the practice has spread quite well across, you know, the <clears throat> a lot of the corn production areas, you know, so there's a lot of guys reporting good success with it. As it says, timing is key, right? After that weed free period, or if you're using uh, just a straight glyphosate or um, gramoxone type burn down for your post app, well, you can't use gramoxone. But <laughs> right. If you Liberty or or Roundup, right, and for your traded crops, right. is a good way to go in there and do some weed management for escapes. And again, as we mentioned, we're looking at probably lower corn populations. Uh, so with a flex ear corn, you can probably get away with a lot more than with a fixed ear, depending on again the variety. So it's trials with varieties is very important, right? Again, taller type corns and higher populations, we want to seed earlier. And again, very little mentions of yield loss in these right. practices. Right. Uh, again, on the flip side, very little mentions of high yield gains. But again, that's not what we're looking for in adoption of this practice, right? We're looking to improve soil health for the next year's crop to keep the soil in place when we have serious weather events and high rain events, as well as maybe providing some habitat, right, for beneficial insects with flowering type cover crops. Correct. So just so we're clear and we don't lose anybody, when you say interseeding has RMA restrictions, you're talking about insurance, correct? Crop insurance. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that reads your contract very closely. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yield gains can be gained. You can gain some yields. Uh, we see probably two to three percent yield gains in a lot of cases when we're doing interseeding with uh, legume crops, uh, uh, but it takes a long time for that nitrogen, for those nitrogen plants to build those. So don't expect you know, tremendous jumps in your yields. Uh, uh, the biomasses uh, or the uh, big rooted plants will collect some nitrogen from down low and bring it up. But the neat thing of it is when you shell that corn or cut those beans within probably uh, Three or four days you can throw a bunch of cows or goats or sheep or something out there and gain some grazing if you want to do that and i think that's an opportunity that some of our conventional farmers uh may be missing out on because uh, there would be a way that if you could work with uh, a cow calf or a sheep guy and and let him get some of that gain off of there and you would get the manure from the animals that's a big plus too Yep, a little bit better feed quality. So even it was common, even when we had cattle for us to graze the corn stalks, right? Uh, so here with uh, something growing underneath, you do have a higher forage value from that. So it's important. There is a website, uh, interseedingcovers.com <clears throat> that does offer a lot of comment uh, that's been collected uh, from people practicing here. So this is an example of a screenshot uh, somewhat maybe outdated at this point that talks about what you have to look at in regards to timing with uh, different herbicides. So that's the nice thing about this website is it does have a lot of those types of suggestions and recommendations for herbicide use and timing, as well as common practices with seeding rates and things of that nature. So keep that in mind. If you want to look into the interseeding, uh, this interseedingcovers.com is a good place to go. And we didn't, you know, that's awful hard to see and to prove, but we just want to show you where you can go uh, after the after we get through with the webinar and you can look and see at this and under and 
figure out a lot easier than just trying to stare at it for a few seconds here while we're talking about it. All right, so in-crop late season is, again, another real popular method that a lot of people use, right? So what does that mean? Using airplanes or high clearance seeders, right? Uh, and the big thing with this is that we know need to know what our climate is like and what our weather patterns are especially so that we can get these things accomplished with timely rain especially. Uh, again, uh, the pilots are starting to get booked up as it's more popular, so you can't always get it just the way you want, want it. it right? uh, but again, uh, the effort is worth the try, we think, in this case. I'm telling you, the new airplanes or the guys that's flying cover crops on is doing a much better job now than they were doing 10 or 15 years ago because it was something new for them, just like it's new for you today to try it. But uh, they are able now to pretty well keep the seed in the field that you desire to have it in. There's been years when we first started that I think the neighbors got more than we got. But, uh, you know, with uh, electronics and everything that's happened on airplanes, uh, it works so much better now. And uh, the thing I, my policy is if it's dry, don't fly. But if it's raining, fly it on, you know. Because you need a rain after you have made your, your application of the cover crop into a standing crop for two reasons. It kind of takes that cover crop seed down through the plant that's stuck on the leaves, and it needs that moisture to sprout the seed. Yep. So here are just a few things, again, to check with your aerial applicator. Uh, I'm sure a lot of, of us know ones that have been doing stuff for years, but uh, they do offer some really good services, like Dad mentioned, as Again, all the automated equipment in our tractors has improved, so has it in the airplanes, along with their skills. So that's a good thing to know. Again, the importance of this early seeding is, again, what happens below the soil surface, right? So if we wait till post-harvest, it's cold, there's not a lot of daylight, we don't get a lot of growth, which we see on the left. If we can get the seeds planted in September, we have so much more daylight because the, the corn is senescing, the soybeans are dropping their leaves, we get light down to the seedlings, and they're able to put roots really deep down into the soil, which is what we're looking for. Correct. Uh, you know, and this, this is a good thing to show you because, uh, and that's why we see so much problems with guys with corn and beans and no small grains. Uh, no matter when you get your cover crop in, after you harvest it, it never has enough growth. And you can see that on the picture on the left, you know, uh, we never get the kind of roots that we need to loosen deeper than a foot in the soil. And we, you know, we like to have roots go three or four foot deep to help bring the channels that would move moisture and earthworms crawl in them and they don't have to do so much work and nutrients move up and down that channel of that root zone, even the years after it's gone, after the top of the plant is gone. So again, with aerial or broadcast application, you have that issue of dispersion, right? Distribution. So it's just something to be aware of and, and appreciate. So you just can see that it's not <laughs> rather uniform. <coughs> then we get into other ways, right? Other than an airplane, you can, if you have uh, some tools available to look at here. Uh, we started again with electric spinners on some high clearance. Uh, this is like a mail row destroyer, just been converted over. And then you can get a little more fancy with the bigger Valmar seeder and then get into even bigger boxes and more width. And we know today with these tools, guys with 120 foot booms can go out there and can see acres per minute, you yeah. know? So the, the speed and reliability with some of these high clearance seeders is far superior to what we've had before. And I think with a, with a, with a high clearance machine, actually what we're doing, you can see that there's air tubes hanging down so actually we're blowing the cover crop in probably at about the ear height or just a hair below the ear, which means we have less leaf surface for the, the seed to catch on. So actually it gets to the ground quicker. Uh, a little bit, I think a little bit more successful uh, than an airplane, uh, especially if it don't rain, you know. Yeah, and the other advantage I think too, well, not advantage, but you're worried about uh, crop destruction as when you go in there anytime, right, with the sprayer. Most of the guys that have been doing this uh, are very good drivers. 
Uh, a lot of times they do match the width with what other uh, equipment you've been in the field with, or maybe it's the same applicator, right? That's been doing your herbicide. So uh, yield loss is fairly minimal, only a few bushel per acre, whether it's corn or soybeans yeah. in that case. Uh, so I think that the benefits far outweigh any of uh, the challenges that would come from that. Most of the loss you'll see is in the headlands. Uh, very seldom do you, unless you fall asleep driving and if you got guidance, you don't have to worry about that. But, uh, you know, uh, is, uh, if you're in the straight rows, it's pretty easy to not run over a corner, but it's on the ends. And uh, we figure we lose about a bush and a half of corn per acre when it's like this. If you've not had uh, something in there previous to that uh, with the same width, you know. Other advances that we're working on are, you know, in row or in crop applicators. So there's a lot of advancements in these small autonomous units right now. It's hard to say, you know, what will happen in the future with uh, swarm technology and things of that nature that would allow you not only to apply uh, in crop uh, pest control or fertility or seeds, right? So <clears throat> these guys will work 24 seven, so long as they've got a power source to return to. And guess what? It's near enough, it goes down through there and you don't have any inroads to knock down. So, uh, you know, uh, if you have about a dozen of them, little yellow humming bees going back and forth, you can get a lot done in a day, you know. They even got them designed now to actually recharge themselves at the end of the field, you know. Unbelievable what technology has done in the past five or six years to get things established easier for us today. So again, generally, uh, we want to try to seed earlier, like in corn, you know, we're looking at 25% of the kernel milk line. Uh, in silage corn, we can be two to three weeks before harvest. Soybeans, we want to get in there when they're pale green uh, and try to get the crop established. If we're yellow to brown, you know, we worry about the leaves following and smothering uh, the crops. We want it to actually be emerging so it keeps the leaves from smothering the, the, what's been broadcast out there with the soybeans. Uh, again, uh, we look for it to take uh, maybe as much as seven to 10 days to germinate, especially if we have limited rainfall from that. Soybeans tend to show a little bit more of a challenge with success rate than with corn. Yes. Just primarily because of that smothering effect of the, the falling leaves. All right, so post-harvest options, again, there's a lot of things that we can do there with different pieces of equipment. Here we have a uh, uh, Lexion uh, combine uh, with a uh, air seeder on the back. And what they're doing here, they're blowing the cover crop underneath the header. And uh, the corn fodder residue falls on it, or the soybean residue from the back will fall on it. and uh, they have pretty well matched the uh, the air seeder with the size of grain tank. So when they're dumping the grain, uh, they can fill the uh, the air seeder. And there's different complexities. You know, this is more of a homemade unit uh, with a typical type of uh, seed distributor. Again, just trying to blow it underneath the header and get some distribution across there. Smaller units would work as well, mounted on the header. This is Ray McCormick in Indiana. Uh, he's done several different versions of this here. And in fact, the Gandhi actually makes a very specific unit just for this purpose today because of the work that he did. Yes. Yeah. And of course, here he's probably putting ryegrass in probably at about uh, four to five pounds. So you can get a lot of acres done before you have to refill that uh, 10 or 15 cubic foot box, you know. Hey, we've got a question real quick here. Yeah. Um, in one of your early slides with the cover crop seed list, you mentioned some roots go down six feet. Would that be the radish? Uh, just uh, it'd curious. probably be the sunflower, the millet. Uh, radish will probably be about four foot. Okay. Is that even in clay soil? Yeah. So in, in looser uh, loamy soil, the roots will go slightly so deeper. deeper. And again, uh, you could see some radish, the very fine roots down below four feet. Yep. A lot depends on your soil types. 
<clears throat> and availability, you know, to go down that far. So, but again, the small grains generally have a lot deeper root systems than the legumes. And we will see some brassicas, depending on the season, get down below that four feet mark. But again, it's all about the timing from that. And persistence is key. The more you use it, the farther the they'll go. The deeper they'll go. Right. Yep. Right. You're absolutely right, Gene. Yes. Uh, here we just have a drill uh, that they're sowing their cover crops with. Just giving you some ideas of different things that we saw that we thought were interesting. Uh, don't have to have modern stuff. Uh, uh, this is just a uh, three-point lift uh, spreader box, and he's got a VT, no, a rolling basket. A rolling basket. Uh, he's not got his uh, shanks in the ground. He's just using rolling baskets to incorporate the seed and off and running. I really like these tools, especially if you set them correctly. Uh, this is a vertical tillage tool. That means it should be run shallow, fairly fast. And straight. And straight. Uh, if we set this, so this tool will run about an inch and a quarter to an inch and three quarters deep. It does no more disturbance to the soil than a double disc drill will do. Uh, so you can run about six or seven mile an hour with this air seeder on there, uh, flatten out your soils, chop up your residue, uh, and get your cover crop seeded. And the nice thing about these, again, is when you get a little bit of that seed to soil incorporation, right, <clears throat> rather than just broadcasting on the surface. So comes and, up quicker. Yep. Just to clarify on what you were saying with straight you mean the gang angle being straight not driving Correct. straight yes. down yes. the road gang angle straight. Correct. a lot of these vt tools you can go from zero to seven degrees or something yes. like that so you want to run them in a straight line and not straight on an as angle possible. right yep so we even have these uh odd type of tillage tools with seed boxes <laughs> on them so again you can modify just about anything if you've got enough imagination uh, to get things going so that allows you here in the late fall to have a nice even distribution of seed to help not only stabilize your soil, but the residue as well, and to keep those ditches clear. We get a little closer up seed. You can see here we have rye and radish and rape growing in there. Uh, so we've got some diversity as well. Yes. So this is a, a seeding rate again that would have been done fairly early, like after corn silage, right. uh, before as we're going into winter. And this is about the you know as heavy as we want to see it uh, in the fall. It doesn't have to be you know thick as hay from that standpoint to do the job that it needs to do. Yeah. And there's also some crimson clover there. That's what you see getting ready to bloom. So it was done fairly early, or it wouldn't have been blooming at this point in time. But, you know, we're just trying to show you that it doesn't have to be thick as hair on a dog to do the job, you know. Yep. So, again, pros and cons that we talked about. Um, drill is good for seed to sow contact to all species uh, as quick as the width of your drill is. Uh, and, uh, again, used throughout the year. Again, our calibration is really important on that to make sure you get your seed rates correct. Just in your hybrids of the corn, maybe you want to cut off a day or two day length. That will help you give harvest about a two or three day window. Two or three day window on a cover crop means an immense difference in the amount of growth you have. Yeah. And with the planter, before they were saying that it's slower. Again, if you've got a splitter planter or a 15 or 10 inch row planter, you're really not going any slower with that. Uh, in, in fact, if it's larger machine, you might be going faster than, rather than using a small spreader or a grain drill. So it all depends on your situation. Again, drills and planters are gonna give you the best seed to soil contact. Uh, and again, uh, gives you a lot of options for what you're doing. And use less seed with a drill and a planter. Yep. So I was having this conversation with the guy earlier um, and uh, he's got a 40 foot drill and he was off broadcasting his seed at 40 foot uh, passes uh, with uh, just a, like a fertilizer spreader, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I tried explaining to him that you're putting in a cover crop, you're not putting in a cash crop. So to go eight mile an hour, nine mile an hour, you know, with your 40 foot drill can be obtainable um, and get your same speed and better 
uh, better planting uh, emergence yes. using your drill versus a spreader. Uh, was I wrong in that comment with him? No, you was right. You're absolutely right. Well, definitely right. Yeah, if you've got level fields and you know you don't have to worry about breaking row units off, you know you can do that six to eight miles an hour easy with the big grain drill. And again, like you say, the seed placement is just so much better if it broadcast on the surface. And you know, if you're going to broadcast it, you're going to up your seeding rate by thirty percent, just because all of it won't catch. You know. But again, the big thing with the airplanes is it's very fast, uh, but you do need rain, and not all species, especially large seeded ones, you know, we'll are are going to work broadcast, especially with an airplane. Again, we talked about it's all about the roots, right? So one day in September gets you five days in October. So again, this is just an example with oats showing you the difference between something 60 days old versus 45 days old and the amount of root growth that we get to stabilize the soil, to feed the soil microbes, all that is very important. Again, because the roots, right, they leak sugars, uh, they associate with the mycorrhizae in the soil. And again, that's how we build up these, these structures in the soil and lead again towards lower nutrient needs and, and better weed control as well in the future. Spring management, early termination or planting green. We prefer to plant green, uh, mainly because our soils are heavy clays that don't dry out very fast. So we utilize the cereals and the clovers to pull moisture out of the soils in the early spring uh, so that we can plant uh, timely. Yep, and this is a picture of a mix in front of corn that we really like to see. Uh, we can see that the heads have emerged on the rye, so we're in Antithus where the rye uh, is pollinating. We've got several blooms on the vetch. You can see the purple clover or the purple flower is in there. So we know we've got about five to seven blooms and we're in the early pod set stage so that we can mechanically terminate this and eliminate the burn down pass. So that's really helpful for us in you know, managing uh, weed pressure and our infrastructure costs. Yes. Uh, you can turn it brown uh, like this and it needs to be brown and crispy. You don't want it light blue or, or, or light green because then it's, uh, it will hairpin in the seed trench. You'll have a hard time getting the seed slot closed because it'll be damper. So you need to make sure you're at least two and a half or three weeks uh, brown before you plant. And uh, then the problem is if you're that far out and we get an inch and a half or two inch rainfall event, it is really tough to get that soil dried out with that much residue being dead before you plant. Yeah, but then it leads all to management, right? right? So if you've got uh, sandy soils, you probably do want to do that early termination uh, so that you don't run out of water as your, your plants are emerging. So it's all about management from that standpoint. Like Dad said, in our clay soils and in the types of rainfall events that we have in the spring, we need to grow the moisture out. And in this picture, I'm also going to guarantee you that there's slugs and army worms and cut worms and seed corn maggots uh, because that stuff's been brown for two weeks, it's dead. Uh, you got to visualize that uh, those type of insects have not had anything to eat, so they're getting thin and hungry. And the first thing that comes up is the green shoot of corn, and they're eating on it pretty heavily. And that's why we continue to plant green instead of brown. Uh, you know, those animals we talked about, or those insects we talked about, do not like corn. Uh, They'll eat corn and they'll do destruction to corn. But if you have a cover crop there, they'll stay on the cover crop and eat on it and not bother the corn as much by planting into it green. And the and other so thing, by saying by saying turning it brown, you're talking chemical termination here, correct? correct? Correct. Yes. Yes. Yep. And so again, with we're waiting because we like to plant green when the crop is mature. So here we see the date stamp in the lower right hand corner. It's only the 12th of May. Uh, generally, for us to see that previous picture is going to be after the, the 20th of May, really, right. to be at that stage. So now we may be past some of these uh, pests, uh, like Dad mentioned, that their, their life cycle is already past where they're going to do crop impact. 
Uh, so you have those two things going to your advantage of planting green and delaying planting for timing just to avoid some of these pest cycles. So again, we talk about uh, the growth stage of the cereals, right? Uh, the zaduk stage is one that we talk, talk about. So generally we wanna be at pollination, which is gonna be after the zaduk 60 for sure. We wanna have antithes. And if we're little even past uh, pollen set, pollen given off where we're getting some uh, milk stage, that's even better for success. Again, to have the, the other challenge with mechanically termination, which is what we're talking about with this, is having enough plant density. If it's very light uh, seeding rate, the roller crimper doesn't work as well. Uh, so again, the heavier the biomass, generally the better performance you see with the roller crimper. Correct. With legumes, uh, we're looking for early pod set for things like peas or vetch. Again, with crimson clover, it's gonna be in full bloom. So you know you're gonna be where the stems are hollow and you'll be able to crimp and terminate. So again, it says here, like we want five upper nodes to divide, as well as the ability to see maybe some early pod set. And that's gonna give us the best success for mechanical termination with vetch. Well, this is, we're planting the soybeans into rye in mid-May. Uh, this was back in uh, the early 70s. Uh, and uh, you can see that the rye is as tall as the wheel, wheel on that 3020, so it's probably five foot tall. You know, going right through it, not having a problem. Can you say a word to the people that are scared to do that right now? I mean, everybody's probably sitting here thinking like, uh, I, I just can't do it. My nerve level won't let me. <laughs> into something that tall that's going to shade out my crop that's only going to get hip high to begin with uh just uh give them a, a little level of security i mean i know you've been doing this for a long time but uh some words of encouragement at that level. I, I think the words of encouragement here is that we can get by with uh uh with some kind of mechanical termination of like a crop roller or a call to packer uh, we prefer a crop roller because it actually crimps it and it'll die quicker than it will with a call pack or a rolling basket. But, you know, uh, just get started into it. You'll enjoy it. Uh, uh, we say less insect problems because we're later. The soils are warmer. They're up in their 60 degrees. And then three days you can roll, row the beans or row the corn. And they, it just does not slow down. And we actually harvest the same time that our neighbors are planting on the 15th of April, you know. So uh, we've not seen delayed harvest dates by postponing planting time. Yep, and again, to, for starting, you want to probably look at some early termination. So it's good to have a small field uh, and go ahead and burn off the outside rounds and leave the center standing. And that way you can compare and see any difference uh, when you're planting. As always, you know, we want to don't say do the whole farm this way. Start with uh, the field that's somewhere where you can see it, <laughs> and give you a little bit of, of pressure to watch what's going on. Uh, but again, everybody that we've talked to and, and, and counseled throughout the years, and ourselves as well, uh, the more you get involved in it, the more comfortable you become, and you look forward to that event. So the big thing other that we're looking at, you know, is that. Planting with this, you don't have to deal with a lot of dust uh, as long as the pollen is passed, of course, uh, but it does keep things cleaner uh, from that standpoint. So on, on the corn, I've both had personally had success and failure planting into rye with corn. Um, so I, I'll say what I, I've done, both failure and uh, with success real quick but I'll also let you uh, weigh in and see if you say anything different. So my first failure or my failure came from uh, planting the rye without terminating it prior to planting with the corn. We got rained out of that field and it, for about two weeks and the rye became, I don't know, six foot tall or so and uh, robbed all of the nitrogen that I had pre put. And also, uh, it just overshadowed it and the corn never made it out. So we ended up with a 30 to 40 bushel um, reduction in yield on that field. Um, 
So the very next year I turned around and did it again. Um, and I terminated the day of planting and uh, I front loaded a lot of nitrogen. I went with 15 gallons on the planter and 20 gallons with a weed and feed six days later. Uh, but that rye still was at about 30 inches tall when, uh, when I sprayed it off and then planted and uh, ended up with a phenomenal year that year. So in, if I was to say anything, the biggest thing is nitrogen management. If you're gonna plant corn into rye and front load a lot of nitrogen. I agree with you, Shane. Uh, you know, the rye is a grass, just like the corn is a grass, and the, and the rye is going to take the nitrogen way before the corn will take the nitrogen because it's there growing. Uh, so, I, you know, uh, we have the, in most of those fields, you didn't get to see the clovers and the vetch that was in there, so we don't have to worry about front loading uh, when we have that much legume pressure. But if it's straight rye, yes, you have to front load by 30 or 40 pounds. Uh, I think uh, so. You do do not see a problem with the corn uh, because the rye actually ties it up and then it re-releases it then just about when it's doing grain fill or July. You know, so you don't lose it, but it just it makes that uh, corn plant look yellow and spindly when it's first coming out without front loading some nitrogen. Correct. Yep, and with corn especially, we do like to roll down the cover crop. Uh, we know that corn does not like uh, neighbors, right? <laughs> Doesn't like shade when it's young. So getting that uh, cover crop rolled down or mashed down somehow before you get uh, the corn too far emerged is really helpful in having a step, a good establishment. And you so don't care how you do that if you're not at thesis then, right? If, well, you're... if you terminate with herbicide, you can still, it, it'll fall down. It'll fall down, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you don't worry about rolling it. No, no. Okay. No. So the other option is to have, say, a planter mounted roll crimper like Lucas Griswell here has. Uh, or, and as well, you know, this was an early version that had some fairly aggressive row cleaners on it. He's gone away from those to have less soil movement. Uh, but again, the modern ones, the, the more recent marketed ones have a lot more of adjustment to them than these early models did. Uh, so again, this gives you a great option for control. Obviously, he's not going to roll crimp the rye that he's in right now. <laughs> no. But uh, you know, he has a lot of success. He's got a lot of videos on YouTube showing his management practice with that. And he plants corn straight into straight rye with great success using the technique that uh, Shane, you mentioned. So this, again, is what that looks like with those aggressive row cleaners. Uh, and that's again, an option that you have where it lays it down and it, it works really well for weed suppression and to maintain soil moisture. Uh, it's just a great way to go. But the only weeds he really has is where the row cleaner has, you can see there's bare soil there. So the corn comes up and so does some of the weeds in that little narrow path there. So uh, sometimes he has to go back and use a post herbicide just because of the pressure in the row, not because of the pressure where the rise land. And, and that's why he took the row cleaners off, you're saying? Yes, that's correct. Yep. Yep. So same similar concept here that we, you talked about, Shane, if you're going to plant into rye here and you're going to front load your fertility, rye at this stage uh, would fall down pretty fast once yep. you kill you're it. Going. And you don't have to worry about that growth interference so much. So again, we talk about our mature rye here in a cover crop. So this is a cover crop going in front of corn. Uh, and so we, we're using a roll crimper here to roll this down in front of the corn planter just because of the vetch and the clovers that were in there that made it so, it was difficult to walk through even. We were breaking shear pins like crazy. So again, we roll it down. Uh, this was pre-guidance days. We're using the row marker here. It makes a decent enough uh, mark that you can see where you're going. And again, we don't have, because those cover crops are just intertwined in each other, we don't have any issue with directionality of where the roller went. Uh, and with good coulters, it just cuts right through. Uh, we only use this factory rubber closing wheels and have very good uh, results with uh, collapsing that sidewall in the system like this. Yes. Some other things that we've tried is uh, 
for inter you know, since that you saw our planter head, that was an eight row with seven splitters. Uh, we introduced soybeans in the seven boxes, planted soybeans at the same time, uh, trying to see if we could get enough nitrogen from the beans for the corn and uh, did not, it did not make 100% nitrogen for the corn, but it made probably 50% of the nitrogen the corn needed. Because you can, as you see there, it's pretty dark green right now and there's no nitrogen been added, you know. Just some can options we looked at. Can I take one slide back when you guys were planting into uh, that rolled down uh, rye right here? Earlier, you were talking about uh, not planting into a rolled down green crop like this or a blued, let's call it a blued uh, rye plant, right? For pinning purposes, would, a, would somebody have trouble in this stand right there with pinning? Um, directly not, with, not when you're rolling ahead of the planter uh you know if you roll two days ahead of time yes you would have but we're rolling probably within an hour of the planter being ahead of there and the reason is that uh, that mark arm has a half inch shear bolt on it and without it being rolled it was knocking five or six shear pins out every round and david just didn't crawl want to crawl out of the cab anymore so we went and got the crop roller and solved that problem you know? Right. So, so if you terminate too far ahead of the planter, you will have problems. But yes, with this correct. Being, with this being right. green and juicy, and it, it won't hairpin. No, it will not hairpin. Right. Okay. And again, we, we mentioned this interplanting. We've looked at other uh, legume species as well, cowpea, sun hemp, uh, specifically in the warm season scenario. The only time we really see any advantage in this was in a droughty year uh, where we did have more additional shading in the row. So otherwise it was generally a wash from that standpoint. Again, if we're, we're other folks are looking at this concept again because of the ability to harvest two crops at once and do seed separation. Uh, but in that case, you're gonna look at like a dwarf corn so that you're not pulling too much residue through. This just shot of our new planter. Uh, this was new last year for us. It has no chains. It's all uh, electric over hydraulic, nothing to catch on. But you can see how big that vetch is. Uh, it was probably six foot tall. Uh, you can't walk in it. Uh, if you get a deer, a young deer out there running around, you have to stop and let her get out of the way because it is so thick she can't run through it. But you can see how the marker arm actually lays that vetch down almost enough to kill it, you know. Yeah, so again, that's like, like I said, any modern planter within, you know, the last 10 years is, is going to be very uh, adept and adaptable to plant into cover crops, even this heavy. So again, we talked about uh, maybe some type of plastic row cleaner or some type of disc, right? Because we don't want spiky things to gonna catch our viney plants like vetch and peas. Uh, but if you need to have a little bit of a clear path, certainly we can use some attachments uh, that can make it a little bit easier in regards to management. So if they do have a row cleaner and let's say they've just lifted it so that they can plant into something like this, are right. they gonna run into snagging and snagging trouble with them just hanging out into a heavy clover like this or a yes, rye they will if it's real spiky they also have snags yeah yeah okay so they should be pulling fingers or wheels off if they're right. going to try and do this yep yeah what other folks have done is they've taken uh used disc blades and backed you know, like if you've got a, a martin type spiked grow cleaner you can put some type of backer on those and then you don't have the issue right but shark tooth uh, row cleaners seem to work much better yeah, in, gotcha. in heavy residue situations because they're, you know, they're, they're kind of reverse spin through there and they don't tend to catch as much. Same way with curved closing wheels uh, in this situation tend to be have less issues. Some of our last topics, again, to introduce concepts of using strip till for management and perennial cover crops and probably uh, the best two things to put together. Again, the idea that you can prepare your soil if you're in an area, again, where uh, 
uh, moisture evaporation are, are things that we worry about from that standpoint. I know that's a, a, an area of shame where you're real concerned about is having soil that you can get out into just because of how wet things are and getting the soil warmed up. This is definitely a good tool to use. We've talked about a couple of means of managing that cover crop uh, in there. Uh, so if you're going, and a species selection can be helpful, right? To keep it small as opposed to really tall, we can look at those types of concepts as well. In this case, if we're using a perennial cover crop, say red clover or some of the uh, white clovers like Cura or Everlasting, you have the opportunity to use, say, a burned down herbicide uh, to come in pre or post planting uh, so that you minimize competition uh, but aren't uh, eliminating then that perennial cover crop. What do you think, Shane? Have you, what are your thoughts on incorporating that? I don't know. That looks beautiful. It widened my eyes when I saw this picture, but it's awful pretty scary too in our heavy clays uh, to dabble in something like this. Uh, but uh, I can definitely see the benefit almost as if you guys planting green, you know, for moisture mitigation. Uh, let it grow, be able to plant. And if you are using, you know, chemical termination, you come back over with uh, your, I guess you would call it your post plant, but your pre-emerge yeah. um, and, and take that out there. You probably wouldn't even need any really, on this, on this, and this happens to be little river tillers that this guy's using. They're tilling up about a two or three inch deep channel there. They plant the corn in there, and then they let that cover crop grow back over towards the corn because the corn is probably five or six inches tall before that cover crop will grow over close to it. And they actually suppress the weeds that way, you know. So they leave the clover grow. They just leave the clover grow. Most organic guys do a lot of things like this, you know. So again, just to bring that picture back up is another way to look at that, utilizing, say in this case, rather than the bio strip till, you use a, a strip freshener to go in there and, and manage that from that standpoint. So I think there's a lot of opportunity uh, for, especially for someone going from full width tillage uh, and then incorporating cover crops, right? Mm -hmm. So we're using uh, step increment improvements in practice. Uh, again, there's several people that have uh, gone from full width tillage using strip till, becoming comfortable with management of cover crops, and then eliminating uh, the strip till because of the improved soil health uh, and water infiltration, right, where they didn't need to dry the soil out and they were getting warm enough soils. So that's all those things that we look at in going into, you know, improving soil health and minimizing then our inputs and our our operating costs awesome. with maintaining right. equipment and things. So yeah. a lot of opportunity there. Another picture here, we see a guy with a big uh, uh, Montag unit up there running the strip till in uh, some type of probably legume cover crop going into corn production. So uh, again, becoming more and more of a common practice in areas. Uh, we have the equipment that we can do this. And again, it provides a means of less risk uh, in this scenario. So it, it always helps that transition, improve profitability, mitigate risk. Those are things we want to consider. So that's it for our presentation on that. Uh, any questions that we can take? Will this talk be posted anywhere so I could direct others to it? Uh, yes, it absolutely will be. Uh, I think I mentioned it earlier. Um, these have all been, all four of these so far have been posted on YouTube. If you go to Ohio TNC Agriculture, if you go to their site and click on the videos, uh, you can find all four of these. They're not, I don't believe they're all together. They're just kind of scattered with some of the other videos that they've put out. Um, but uh, they will all be titled deep dive uh at some level there and you can you can watch all four of these over and thank you for the compliment J uh they said great job guys uh and that mainly goes to you jay and dave you guys have done an amazing job with your presentations here thank you very much we, I, we enjoyed doing it and trying to show people how they can be more regenerative uh 
uh, by using cover crops, conserving uh, energy, uh, keeping soil where it belongs. And uh, as you do these things, then I think you need to learn to reduce the nutrients as you go. Uh, because if you're not losing soil, you don't need to replace in the nutrients because you didn't have soil erosion. And that's a hard lesson to learn. And you just have to do trials and on your farm to see how much you can drop. Uh, you know, we're we're probably 80% away from using what we used uh, 25 years ago. You know, and herbicides probably 60 to 70% less than we used 10 years ago, you know. So uh, we're still using some guys and gals, you know, but uh, you know, uh, we've learned to reduce and still maintain uh, satisfactory yields for us to be profitable. And that's the key point for us. It's not about the bushels we take off, it's the profitability at the end of the day. So it's the combination of practices uh, and then what our yield goals are based on those practices that help us maintain that viability on the farm with what we're doing. We have another question. I have polyspiked closers on my planter. Will this cause problems planting into vetch? Mm. Those would be like uh, no. copper heads or the stitchers, right? No, they will work. Polys will, because they're smoother. Yep. Those will work. Like like the twisters or, yeah, the copper heads where they're right. big. Yeah, Yeti, yes, Yeti poly work. twisters. Yeah. So I've, I have personally used the poly twister for three years now planting into rye and I haven't had any trouble with it. And I'm also using a drag chain behind them and I haven't had any trouble with it. Good, good. Um, so do you guys want to take another second here to uh, um, talk about organic matter? I think that was one of the points that we missed when you're giving your key points earlier. Um, I, I really look at the organic matter portion of this as being a huge uh, key point um, in what we want to call regenerative um here not just cover crops uh, i believe you guys have had a phenomenal success story on where you started with your organic matter to where you are now on your home farm uh you want to talk a little bit about that well we bought when we bought this home the home farm from grandfather we had about a half percent organic matter uh today we're setting on about uh uh six percent on the knobs and eight in the lower plateaus or the flatter grounds. Uh, uh, was real impressed with what we saw. And we you could do that by using these cover crops. By using a single cover crop, it's going to take a lot longer. As we look at multiple species, and especially if you put wheat in rotation, you can gain organic matter very quickly, probably to the tune of a half to three quarters of a percent a year. If you're going after wheat, uh, if you're in a corn bean rotation, you probably gain about one or two tenths a year. So that just gives you an idea how much longer it's going to take for you to build that organic matter. But if you think about organic matter as you build it, uh, they're talking about uh, carbon credits, and we won't even talk about that. But uh, if we could gain a half a point a year in organic matter, that means we'd have 25 to 30 pounds of extra nitrogen every year after that, we would hold somewhere between 17,000 to 19,000 gallon more water in the soil. So imagine what that means in August when it's not raining, it's hot and dry, you know. Those are the points I like to think about. And that's why we're so in tune with these larger covers behind small grains to make it work better. I agree. Like here in Northwest Ohio, it seems like we always want to plant when it's raining and grow crops when it's dry. Like, I don't know why we can't switch this around, <laughs> but the more water we can hold in our soil would, would be a blessing. Right. Yes.
I'm All right. Staying yeah, here. I think, yeah, that's really good. Uh, again, so if, as you start to consider uh, what you're going to do this year, you can reach out to uh, Shane and ourselves with any further questions about how to do some planning in, in your scenario and your system. Uh, and we always are interested in speaking to others, especially about uh, their successes and plans for the future. So thank you, everybody, for, for joining us. We appreciate the opportunity here. Yes, thank you. Um, if anybody wants to contact myself, uh, my email is countrysidelm, that is in, as in lima monkey at gmail.com. So countrysidelm at gmail.com. Or you can look up Jay and Dave at walnutcreekseeds.com. Uh, they've got a great website there. Um, lots of information, lots of resources. Or feel free to reach out to the Ohio uh, Nature Conservancy. Uh, they will be able to get, get a hold of me there through the uh, Farmer Advocacy Program. Um, and if anybody is looking to do the Pharmacy Advocacy, Farmer Advocacy Program, um, reach out. Uh, they have another program that they just started, uh, I believe a couple months ago, and it sounds like something they're gonna try and keep going from here. Um, so uh, yeah, feel free to reach out to Stephanie Singer there um, and she can help you out if you're interested in doing a program like this yourself. Um, she just added that in the chat. It's HTTPS uh, dot dot, what is that? Semicolon forward slash forward slash www.farmeradvocatesforconservation.com forward slash. So again, we'll try and have that posted um, or just email myself or Dave and Jay also know how to get a hold of me. So thank you all for your time. It's been a pleasure working with these guys for the last four months, putting this on for all of you guys. I'm very thankful to have them in my arsenal. So uh, thanks again for coming. If you have any questions, reach out.